Welcome everyone. I'm David Moss. I'm the Senior Editorial Director here at IJNet. Uh, thank you all for joining us this morning um, for this reporting forum session we're hosting on uh, the U.S. election and specifically on the upcoming uh, Republican and Democratic National Conventions here. If you're new to us, we're running this session through our uh, Crisis Reporting Forum, which runs regular online sessions uh, in five languages, in, uh, in addition to English, Arabic, French, Spanish, and Portuguese. Now, today, uh, a brief intro, you know, the U.S. President, presidential election, as it stands now, uh, will be a reprise of four years ago in terms of candidates, and, and I say as it stands now, um, but the, the conventions do promise to be a flashpoint of, you know, the hyperpolarization that really marks the country today. Uh, in a year of many elections globally, Americans and the rest of the world are following the U.S. vote very closely, and journalists uh, will play a critical role in informing about developments on the ground and the issues at stake to voters. Joining me today to discuss all of this, we have four really great panelists. Um, I'll start with Craig Gilbert. Craig is a political columnist for the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel and a Lubar Fellow at the Marquette Law School. He served as the Journal Sentinel's Washington Bureau Chief for more than 20 years. He has covered every presidential candidate campaign since 1988 with a focus on the battleground state of Wisconsin. Also joining us is Elena Schneider uh, from Politico, where she is a national political reporter, and she's covering the 2024 presidential campaign, primarily focused on Biden's reelection. In 2022, she was a part of the Politico team that won the Toner Prize for their coverage of the fall of Roe v. Wade, and she previously reported on House, Senate, and gubernatorial races in 2018 and 2016. Hope Moses is a recent graduate of Marquette University and an incoming Master of Science candidate at Northwestern's Medill School of Journalism. Hope previously interned, among other places, at the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. And during her senior year of college, she served as executive editor of the Marquette Wire student newspaper. And last but not least, we have Katherine Jacobson from the Committee to Protect Journalists. She heads CPJ's U.S., Canada, and Caribbean program. And prior to working at CPJ, Catherine lived and reported in Ukraine and Russia for outlets including the AP, Bloomberg Businessweek, and Foreign Policy. Now today, our panelists will discuss some tips for reporters covering the conventions, how journalists can stay safe reporting on them, including on any demonstrations that may break out around them, um, how journalists can effectively engage audiences with their coverage of the of the events on the ground, and, and much more. And I'll add that if you have any questions as you're watching and following along, feel free to drop them in the Q&A function, and we will do our best to get to them. Finally, this discussion is a collaboration with a few partners that I'd like to, to mention here. Uh, in addition to us at IJNet, we're working with the Foley Foundation, Northwestern University, Marquette University, and the Committee to Protect Journalists to bring this session to you today. Now, with all that, I'd like to get started. And Craig, I want to start with you. You have covered many previous conventions um, and campaigns. In your experience, how will this year's convention compared to past ones uh, differ? Yeah, so these are the first, can you hear me? These are yeah. the first, um, you know, real in-person convention since 2016. So I'm very curious about the answer to that question uh, myself. Um, I covered the 14 conventions starting in 1992 through 2016. And I think one of the, you know, lessons for reporting on these conventions or one of the um, guideposts is to sort of bring a kind of historical perspective to covering this convention. I mean, you may not have been at the 2012 or 2016 or 2004 convention, but uh, I think it's helpful to revisit those conventions going into this convention to have sort of an historical baseline. Um, you know, what? how is this convention conducted differently uh, than past conventions? Again, it's been eight years, a lot has changed in eight years. Um, you know, and what does that tell us about uh, politics? And also obviously more importantly, how, you know, do the parties look differently than they did in 2016. Uh, um, uh, they do. I mean, if you go back to 2016, you know, Donald Trump, same nominee, but a totally different um, 
context. I mean, a lot of the Republicans went into that convention. Delegates and officials had not supported Donald Trump in the primary. Some of them hadn't even endorsed him by the time of the convention. Uh, there were a lot of qualms about Donald Trump. Obviously, um, it's a very different story today. But one, a couple of points I wanted to make about covering conventions that I think apply no matter kind of what your your mission is. I mean, all of you on this call have to figure out, you know, based on your interests, based on your audience, based on your role and your expertise, you know, exactly what kind of stories you want to tell. Everybody's covering these conventions differently. But the, the cool thing about conventions, I think, is that there's so many different ways to gather material for those stories. Um, you know, obviously you have what happens on the television screen, which you don't need to be at the convention to see, but, you know, these are giant scripted television ads, but the messages that are delivered tell us a lot about the candidates and the parties, but there's also um, a beehive of activity kind of outside um, offstage uh, at conventions. I mean, there are fundraisers, there are think tank events, there are party events, there are media panels. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on. There are a lot of people who are running around, available to talk to from all different backgrounds. Um, and that's a great uh, reporting tool. Obviously, there's what happens on the streets, you know, with protests and demonstrations. Um, there are the delegates, which, you know, these people are the party. They come from all over the country. They may all be hardcore party people, but they may represent different kind of regional interests and politics and are they unified are they not unified but this is the only time they all come together and they're a tremendous resource for telling stories about you know who, who what the parties represent um there's the money which is sometimes a little harder to get at to but it's you know who's paying for these conventions where's the money coming from what rep what interests do they represent uh there's also the host states and cities um you know, in in these two conventions, you got Chicago and Milwaukee, which are two big kind of northern cities with all the sort of attractions and challenges and problems that cities have. Um, there are you can tell any kind of story, um, you know, venturing out into Chicago and Milwaukee, um, depending on, you know, who you're writing about, what kind of problems or policies you're writing about, what kind of people you're writing about, what kind of issues you're writing about in those two cities. Uh, there's also the in the case of the Republican convention, there's, you know, my my state of Wisconsin, which is a, you know, has been a battleground ever since I started covering conventions in 1992. And if you if you want to write about the general election and the battlegrounds, it's a perfect place to do that. You've, you know, you're in the city of Milwaukee, which is a key part of the political dynamic in Wisconsin, but you've also got these suburbs outside Milwaukee, which have been historically very Republican, but they're getting less Republican. And what happens, you know, this sort of suburban trend away from the Republican Party is a huge part of the battle for states like Wisconsin. So another kind of rich source of stories. Um, and and so whatever your mission is, um, I think you have the tools, you know, even though there's a zillion other reporters running around, um, and even though the conventions are very scripted and even though they may be more scripted than they were in the past, and even though our access as reporters may in some ways be more limited than the past, I'm very curious to see what that looks like. All these things are true, but, you know, you're there in kind of a, um, you know, it, it's really an abundance of reporting opportunities under any circumstances. I think that it's just very important to keep in mind kind of going in what you're a precise mission is and and how you're going to be approaching this convention differently from other reporters and then be being very strategic about all the opportunities you have for gathering material on those stories. Great. Thanks, Craig. Now, Elena, I want to bring you in. I know you'll be in Chicago covering the DNC as your focus is on uh, Biden's re-election bid. Um, you covered the last DNC, which was all virtual. Now, what what new experience are you expecting covering this in-person event this year in Chicago? Yeah, I mean, so much is going to be different than what it was like in 2020. I mean, we all watched uh, the convention in on the Democratic side from our couches. 
um, including, uh, well, he wasn't sitting on a couch, but President Biden did his his acceptance speech for the nomination from Wilmington, Delaware, instead of from Milwaukee, which is where it was supposed to be in 2020. So, so much is going to feel and look different this year. But we do know from the DNC and from, from some previewing of the convention that we can expect some of the elements that they feel like that worked in the 2020 convention to also be repeated again in this one. So um, doing more of these sort of video montages, not necessarily being completely uh, trained just on the stage in Chicago, but but leaning on some of sort of the, the higher production value videos that they can put together ahead of time. We know that Steven Spielberg was involved in a lot of the production of the convention in 2020, and we know that he's reprising that role in 2024. So even though this is going to be very different and that we are, will physically be in Chicago, that we will actually be able to show up um, at so many of these events, be able to witness all of this in person, as Craig was was detailing, it's 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 nonetheless going to still have some echoes, at least on the Democratic side, from what we saw in 2020. And I think, too, what's fascinating in this moment is that there is really a mirror image going into 2024 versus what we had in 20. I mean, you know, in terms of where the incumbent stood in 2020 at this point, Donald Trump was uh, behind his opponent by about nine points in in battle go- battleground and, and national polling averages. And, you know, that, that gap narrowed, but certainly that's what his position was at the time. And now again, we have a broadly unpopular incumbent who is not quite nine points behind, is averaging about, you know, two to three points, depending um, on sort of whether you do head to the head or or the full field, but in, in national and, and battleground polling, he's still behind. And so it's just, it's fascinating to sort of have this moment where, Again, we're reprising these these candidates. We're reprising these roles, but in in an oftentimes a, a sort of a reverse way. Um, so it's going to be fascinating to sort of see these things play out next to each other, given those sort of changing dynamics. And then, lastly, as Craig said, and he laid it out so well, all the opportunities, all the sourcing and reporting opportunities that come from moments like this. It's so rare that we have so many people all gathered in one place. A bummer and a frustration for me as somebody who was excited to cover it in 2020 was that I just try to text people. You're just trying to text people and call people. And sometimes they pick up and uh, sometimes made them a little more available because they were just bored and wanted to talk to another person. But other times it was harder to reach people. And and with being there in person, there's a real opportunity um, and, and sometimes some luck that comes into this of just being able to actually grab people in person briefly to ask them some questions that you wouldn't otherwise have the opportunity to do or a chance to meet people in person that you wouldn't otherwise have an opportunity to do. So I would really encourage people to sort of look at this not only as an, op, you know, as a, as a rich uh, place for stories, but also as a really um, you know, notable sort of sourcing opportunity that we as reporters who are on the Hill will often get by just walking around the halls of Congress. But, but by doing this gathering with, with so many people who are not often in the same room, it's really an exciting way to, to get to know more people that way. Great. Now, Hope, I want to turn to you. Uh, Elena and Craig, they've covered conventions before. This is your first convention that you'll be covering. Um, what are you doing? You know, there's probably a lot of viewers tuning in now who are in a similar position. What are you doing to prepare to cover the convention for, for the first time? Yes, that's a great question. Um, and I think they made some excellent points that I was also going to make today. Um, first, I would say that having the convention in Milwaukee is a very unique opportunity, especially given, um, as was mentioned before, the um, the identity of Milwaukee itself can um, as Wisconsin as a battleground state. So I think I'm just excited for the opportunity. Um, as mentioned again, like so many stories are going to be happening all at once and you can't get to all of them. So some of my like practical tips, I would say, is having some sort of coverage plan. I've been really thinking about what kind of stories I would like to pursue and what kind of stories I'm interested in. Um, you can't make all the events. So I think it's also important to be strategic with what kind of events that you choose. I know that um, it was mentioned that there's going to be events that happen on TV, but there's so many other RNC related events that's happening around Milwaukee that may give you a special opportunity to talk to people that you may not typically talk to who may not have access to the RNC. So um, number one, just having a coverage plan, what types of stories you'd like to cover, what types of stories are going to be important to your audience. Um, number two, choosing wisely on the events that you cover. I think it's also important for something like this, um, as it is going to be my first time being at the convention, um, 
just understanding who the key figures are. So, for example, I know it's been rumored some of Donald Trump's vice president picks. So just researching who they are, um, who the potential uh selection could be, what their platforms are. I think all of those types of things are important. Other key figures who are going to be important to the convention. So um, I would say those are like three ways that I feel are easiest to prepare for it. And then also safety and security, which I'm sure we'll get into in a second. But as a resident of Milwaukee, I feel like I know the area fairly well, but anything can happen. So just having, you know, physical maps on you, if you get split away from your team or if you're going alone, I think it's important to um, just know the area for yourself. So I don't know, those are some practical tips that I've been thinking about. Um, but, you know, they gave some really great tips in the beginning as well. Thanks, Hope. That's actually a perfect segue to what I want to ask Catherine about our expert on safety for journalists here. You know, conventions in the past, there have been protests, there have been demonstrations. Uh, there could be the same at, at these at the ones this summer here in the U.S. Uh, so can you go into some of the physical security precautions journalists can take, some of the digital security precautions journalists can take as well? Yeah, sure thing. Thanks so much. Um, I just wanted to kind of touch on a few of the best practices, which might seem like overkill, but I think are really important uh, to think about ahead of time. The more prepared you are for a variety of scenarios, the better off you'll be safety-wise when covering conventions and also just other stories around it and more broadly in your journalism career. Um, it's good to remember that kind of when dealing with the, it, it's easier to deal with kind of um, the fallout of being doxxed or harassed or anything else if you've kind of taken precautions ahead of time. Um, so when we think about safety, uh, it's useful to think about three different types, digital, physical, and psychological. With digital safety, uh, I like to, to kind of think about it, different sorts of online vul vulnerabilities. So what personal data is available online about you or your family or your friends who might have an open Instagram account with lots of pictures on, of you on it that are tagged. So a good way to assess this is if you open a private browsing window and reverse Google yourself, you can kind of get a general sense of what information is out there. And then you can think long and hard about whether that information is something you want your future employers, sources, contacts, whatever, uh, to see about you. Do you have any old social media posts that might be inflammatory or you know, kind of undermine your reporting? Or do you have pictures of a beach vacation where you had too much fun? Um, that sort of thing. And these might seem innocuous, but again, in the wrong context, these images or tweets or whatever uh, could be used against you or used to undermine your reporting or your newsroom, your colleagues' work, that sort of thing. Um, so there are data broker websites uh, also that can access information, including your phone number, uh, your home address, and stuff like that. So to address this, we recommend kind of going through your social media accounts, seeing what your privacy settings are, and um, figuring out if you want what's currently uh, open to the public to be out there or not. Um, and then there are also data scraping services, uh, or data deletion services, sorry, like Delete Me, that scrape uh, extraneous information from data broker websites. And again, those are really useful for kind of taking precautions against potential doxing or having any sort of public information out there um, that you don't want um, in case of something bad happening. Um, it's also important to think about two-factor authentication for your accounts. Uh, do you have good password security? And are you on alert for phishing emails? So as part of preparation before an assignment, we advise checking in with editors ahead of time to figure out what newsroom protocol is for dealing with online harassment and to discuss also if there are certain groups that become activated online when journalists cover them or certain topics of, of interest. Um, and if you're a freelancer, we also recommend talking with colleagues or friends to develop a contingency plan if something were to go awry. Uh, on the physical safety front, it's important to plan out what you need, where you're going, and uh, when you have enough information to leave. And as Hope mentioned earlier, to kind of review the, the lay of the land. So we recommend uh, establishing a check-in procedure with editors as well as an exit plan from where you'll be reporting. So in the case of the conventions, kind of the area around uh, where you could expect protests to be. So familiarizing yourself with that, and again, with maps. Um, we also recommend bringing a backup battery, wearing comfortable shoes to get away just in case. Um, 
and uh, to avoid wearing media company logos that are big. And this is kind of a shift from what previous thoughts were, you know, the, the more logos and the more identification, the better. It is, uh, of course, essential to have your press pass on you and, and visible, but again, recognizing that, um, you know, kind of the contentious environment that we're in right now might mean that it's best not to advertise to the world uh, that you are a journalist from a great distance, right? Though you should still obviously inform people that you are a journalist when um, when the situation arises. Um, and also I think in, in these protest situations, um, be aware that pepper spray could be deployed, kind of go through and look what previous tactics have been from um, from the police in, in Milwaukee and Chicago, and you know make sure that pepper spray is commonly used and your contact lens wear that you bring your glasses with you and a bottle of water just in case, you know, something gets in your eyes and they could become irritated. So also think ahead of what kind of personal protective gear you might need. Obviously don't go in in full flak jacket and helmet and everything, but have a conversation with your newsroom uh, about whether or not you might actually need something like that or not, or whether again, that would just kind of create more problems than it's worth of carrying around something very heavy that that won't potentially be needed. Um, and also when thinking about situational awareness, make sure you have an eye on where police are ahead of time and other law enforcement um, and look to see if there are any shifts in behavior. So if they're getting their riot gear out, ready to disperse protesters, you know that's kind of a signal that you might wanna get back out of the crowd um, and make sure that you are aware of how um, the situation evolves. And of course, if people are getting overly hostile, try to diffuse the situation and remove yourself um, uh, from the situation as quickly as you can. Um, and also then think about what you would do in the event of being detained. Organizations like the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press have a free uh, legal aid hotline that they'll be monitoring regularly during the convention in case journalists are arrested. Uh, it's really useful to write the number of a lawyer or the the reporters committee hotline number on your arm in Sharpie so that you'll have it um, just in case, you know, something, you know, you know, all of your other possessions get uh, confiscated in the process of being detained. And last but not least, the psychological safety aspect. Uh, make sure you give yourself time to kind of rest and process what's going on. I realize this might not always be possible, um, you know, in the heat of a the, the moment and also during very busy uh, times covering conventions, but it's important to make sure that you have time to, to kind of decompress. So I think that's all for me. Not, hopefully that's not too much doom and gloom. Thanks. No, that's great, Catherine. And I think this is a good time to plug our partners at Foley Foundation and Marquette put together a really great resource that we, we have on IGNet and that we'll share around after this session with just really practical information for reporters who may be traveling to Milwaukee to cover the convention, uh, the Republican National Convention in person. Uh, since, you know, unless you're like Hope, who knows kind of the lay of the land of Milwaukee, uh, this, this offers some just really practical guidance on, you know, downtown resources, transportation routes, weather, what you need to dress for. And I think really knowing the lay of the land can, uh, you know, help uh, with security measures as well. Um, so I want to go back to Elena now. Uh, I think your beat has likely changed or been turned upside down a bit in the last couple of weeks since the uh, presidential debate. Um, and now there's, you know, at least there's talk about the possibility. Um, I'm unable to tell how likely this is, but talk about a possibility of a contested or open convention or that uh, Joe Biden might withdraw from the race. Could you just go into what this would look like if it occurs, what journalists should be on the lookout for if they're covering this aspect of the race? Sure, I'm happy to. So yeah, you're right. My, the, my job uh, turned upside down in the last two weeks um, after we we saw Joe Biden's debate performance in which uh, he was at times incoherent and 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 really displayed some of the concerns about his mental acuity and fitness that have been rumbled about, talked about, um, certainly been raised time and again by voters in public polling, but has been roundly rejected by his inner circle as sort of the answer always being like, watch me, watch, watch Joe Biden campaign, watch him do well in these debates, his State of the Union address, and that will dispel any concerns about his age. Obviously they have failed that test. Um, with this debate, and it's triggered this enormous um, amount of concern and and calls for him to step aside. This is a, a an evolving story. Let's just put it that way. Where every day, um, 
we're trying to report out more and more how uh, party leaders, particularly Democratic elected officials, feel about uh, the president supporting his his um, his his reelection bid. Right now, we have seven House Democrats who have called for him to step aside. But there's not been this cascade of sort of push out or, 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 or um, demands for him to to step out of the race like we may have even expected on Sunday night. Um, this is continuing to sort of, as I said, be an evolving story that we're going to keep covering aggressively over the next couple of weeks. Um, but to give people a sense of the possibility or sort of some of the speculative, uh, you know, what ifs that that certainly we as a newsroom at Politico are working through and thinking through and I'm certainly talking about with my sources. There's a couple of things that that I'd say it's important to keep in mind. So first, um, part of what makes the convention important, the relevance or the reason why parties do these sorts of conventions is obviously there's a lot of things going on. They want to drive a media narrative. They want to um, own a news cycle. They want positive coverage of their party and their nominee. There's all sort of some earned media aspects and strategy to that. But there are some very practical uh, things that also need to get done, primarily nominating their candidates. So uh, that's, you know, we have this primary system where voters vote and and those um, those results then assign delegates per state. It's a convoluted process, one that unfortunately I'm way too intimately involved in now, but but nonetheless, sort of the, the, the broad top line elements to this is essentially that these delegates um, these pledge delegates need to then cast their ballot for the nominee to formally um, put this person forward. And uh, we actually p expect that there's a, a very real possibility that that roll call, as it's sort of informally referred to, could happen before the convention, which is a, a new wrinkle that um, that is really fascinating and, and is playing out as we speak, where initially it was sort of presented to members of the DNC Rules and Bylaws Committee as we're dealing with Ohio. There's a uh, a deadline issue. Um, initially, the the legislature and the governor, Mike DeWine, had passed some legislation to basically move that deadline back so they could proceed with the convention and not have to sort of do something early. But they have sort of pinned it on the Secretary of State saying he's a MAGA guy. We don't know what he's going to do, whether or not there's some shenanigans that might go into this. As a precaution, let's let's have this possibility out there to, to, to potentially do uh, a virtual roll call. That could come as early as the end of July. Now, that date hasn't been officially set yet. The DNC has not officially confirmed that that's actually happening. Uh, but that's still a possibility where a lot of this talk of an open convention could just come to a very abrupt and, and virtual end um, if they chose to do this route. That being said, if that does not happen, and if we do proceed like a convention normally would, and uh, let's say in the next couple of weeks, Joe Biden does decide, OK, I don't want to run for re-election. I'm stepping aside. There's, there's a couple of things that then would immediately start start happening. So the DNC is the ultimate authority for how they put for or who they put forward um, as their nominee should, you know, the, the person who's gone through the primary process pulls out. And, and this is where it sort of gets un, a little uncertain and a little uncharted um, in terms of the territory. There's been possibilities or, or suggestions floated, including by Jim Clyburn, who uh, has kind of walked it up back, but Clyburn suggested the possibility of a, of a quote, mini primary in which candidates would have an opportunity to throw their hats in the ring and, and try and build some kind of momentum around their, their candidacy. The question is, how would the DNC decide what candidates are allowed to actually put their names forward um, to be voted on at the convention? Um, so the DNC is ultimately the one that would make that decision. And certainly that's where the, the possibility of these like backroom deals, um, smoke filled rooms, uh, you know, images that we've heard of from from conventions past sort of come back. I think one possibility that's been floated by um, by some uh, Democratic lawyers is there would be like a straw poll where essentially on the first day of the convention, um, all the candidates who were interested in running for president would 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 put their name out there and the delegates would vote in a in a straw poll, essentially. And let's say the top five vote getters would then be the ones who sort of pass on as like the next round that then delegates could vote on just those five candidates. And that's how they would make the decision. But again, this is really uncharted um territory in a modern context. Cause let it let's also remember that this is not totally new, right? Before um, you know, back in the in the sixties, this is how um, the nominees were were picked and 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 in decades before then that they were chosen by delegates they were chosen at convention we didn't have the traditional primary process that we are so familiar with over the last 50 years or so and you only have to go back as far back as 1968 
which is when um, Lyndon B. Johnson decided in March of that year to pull out of the race and to not run for re-election. And it was at that convention in Chicago where they ultimately chose Hubert Humphrey, who went on to lose to Richard Nixon. And uh, that's why we all sort of, you know, privately joked a little bit when when Demo Democrats did choose Chicago as their convention location, because it was sort of like, are you really going to tempt fate here um, to bring back some of these memories? But but nonetheless, here we are. And and those are some of the like broad strokes of how this might look. But again, this is very much up to the discretion of the DNC and how they would choose to move through this. And I don't want to say that then Jamie Harrison, who's the chair of the DNC, would suddenly become the most powerful person in, in the country. He certainly would have a say and would, have, would be a part of these discussions. But ultimately, the DNC is still an organ and a, and a, and a uh, functioning part of the Biden White House and the Biden campaign. These are people, these are delegates who have been hand-selected and hand-chosen by the Biden White House, by Biden advisors to be the representatives at a lot of these things. So this this wouldn't necessarily be like a rogue group of group of people who would go off and, and demand it to happen on on their own terms. This would very much be directed by by Biden on down. So um, so but but nonetheless, it's still a fascinating question and one that's going to be if if that happens suddenly again, um, our lives become a lot more um, a lot more interesting and a lot more unknown as to how this would go forward. Great. Thanks, Elena. And just a reminder to everyone watching, if you have questions for any of the panelists, uh, feel free to drop them in the Q&A function. We will do our best to, to get to them uh, toward the end of the session. Now, Craig, uh, just a few weeks before the, the debate, uh, you know, there was another major event that, you know, in, uh, had ripple effects on the, the campaigns, and that was Trump's felony conviction, uh, conviction in, in late May. Uh, how... I don't know, do you have any insights into how how that development might influence the RNC that's coming up just next week? Yeah, uh, before I get to that, I just wanted to add another sort of postscript on the safety and security question um, uh, to the excellent presentation earlier. Uh, there are law firms in Wisconsin that are offering assistance to reporters um, and we can, you know, we can make those connections for people. And, and also their guidance, you know, is sort of, the obvious guidance to reporters in situations like that, um, which is, you know, don't participate, don't protest, don't be part of the story, um, don't be adversarial with the police. Um, the police have undergone their own training, of course, and so hopefully, um, you know, that won't be the issue. But uh, but there are additional kind of res legal resources for people. I know in the case of Wisconsin um, and the Republican convention, that are available to reporters if there are any problems. Now, uh, yeah, in terms of on the Trump side of things, um, you know, I mean, these are it'll be interesting to kind of gauge. I mean, one of the one of the reasons conventions are interesting is because you have this group of very partisan delegates who are who are the party rank and file, the party base, and you can take their temperature and you know. Uh, I think we'll find when we talk to them um, that uh, their support for Trump has been, you know, all the more is all the more, you know, impassioned because of his legal problems. And this would, I think, you know, uh, go to the recent trial um, again, compared to 2016, this is a much more uh, pro Trump um, group of people than we had eight years ago. Um, so I, one of the ways in which covering the Republican convention will be interesting is to sort of take the temperature of Republicans with respect to things that aren't going on on stage, but with respect to their own candidates, legal problems, but also with respect to what we've been talking about in terms of the Democrats. Um, you know, there's been a lot of speculation that Republicans, uh, you know, don't want the Democrats to, to change their nominee. Um, it would be interesting to take the temperature of Republican delegates on that question. Um, there's going to be a lot of anti-Biden programming. That'll be part of the story of the convention as well. Great, thanks. Now, uh, Hope, uh, on a different note, you know, there is polling out there that shows that, you know, many young people in this election are undecided uh, on their vote and who they will support. 
Uh, marginalized communities appear also less likely, perhaps, to support the Democratic ticket than in than in recent elections. Um, you are a young journalist. What are some ideas for how how others might be able to to effectively engage young young voters, uh, voters from marginalized communities? Uh, what's worked for you? What hasn't? Yeah, um, that's a great question. I was reflecting on that question before the panel, and I was thinking about how in Milwaukee, like on every corner, there's someone asking you if, you know, you're registered to vote for the 2024 election. And while our role as journalists is maybe not that, maybe not standing on the corners asking people if they're going to vote in the next election, I do think we have a very important role in the voting process by helping people understand the uh, political issues and conversations happening so that they can make the most informed choices for themselves. So um, I have a few tips that I think could help. I think as far as convention coverage, it might be um, helpful to discuss the policies and um, the policies that are talked about at the convention and how that may impact youth voters and individuals a part of marginalized communities. Um, I also feel like I hear a lot of people saying I literally have no clue what is going on. So I think it's going to be important to just break down some of the complex political issues. I think it's easy when you're like a political reporter because this is like your daily job and you're like knee deep into it. But um, the average person, especially those who have somewhat checked out a long time ago, uh, may not be as caught up, uh, may not even know that there's speculation that Biden might drop out. So I think just having explainer pieces like that might be really helpful um, to give people the information they need to um, choose to vote or not to vote. So yeah, and then I would also encourage before the convention, just reaching out to local activists or community members, um, both Republican and Democrat, um, I think that could be really important just to get a better idea of the political landscape here in Milwaukee. And so you don't um, ignore some of those people who, again, maybe youth voters or individuals part of marginalized communities. So, um, yeah, I would say those are some tips that I think could be helpful going into this convention season. Great. Thanks, Hope. And Catherine, on the you know, the security angle, again, we do really want to make that a priority for, for journalists um, covering the conventions, whether, you know, in person, we've talked about the physical considerations, um, but those even covering, uh, you know, who won't be in Milwaukee or Chicago, and you want to bid into, you know, the digital security components. Um, and I think, fortunately, there's more emphasis these days on uh, mental health and the psychological components that you touched on. Um, and I guess, could you go into a bit more of, uh, I guess, like a holistic approach that journalists can take and maybe highlight some other resources that might be at their disposal, like during the conventions and and following and even following them as they continue to cover the campaigns? Sorry, just to clarify. So additional resources for kind of online digital safety or for psychological safety? Sure. Uh, either, both. But, um, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So as far as resources, uh, CPJ uh, has a whole election safety kit. And as part of that, we also have an editor's checklist, which I think is really useful, um, kind of changing the newsroom culture and making sure that, you know, the person kind of at the command center is, is making sure that journalists um, and the newsroom is taking care of themselves and also kind of protecting themselves uh, in, a, in a proactive way by, you know, taking on the steps that I mentioned earlier, as far as like reverse Googling yourself and, and um, figuring out if your accounts are open, that sort of thing. Um, so I highly recommend uh, taking a look at that. And I think that'll be up on y'all's website too, right? Like a link to our uh, digital safety kit and, and checklist, both for reporters and for editors. And then we also kind of have um, a psychological uh, safety well, psychological, I guess, a care kit uh, for reporters and recommendations there as far as like the, which emphasizes again, the importance of taking breaks and, you know, having time to decompress, talking with your colleagues, 
you know, taking time for yourself basically to to process everything that's going on, especially in this very contentious election cycle. And um, and so we have those resources, and I know that the Dart Center as well at Columbia University also has some fantastic resources for dealing with um, you know kind of uh, reporting related uh, traumas or stresses that that might come up uh, in the course of reporting. So. Great. Um, yeah, so we do have a link to the the safety kit that you mentioned in our resource that I mentioned earlier. Again, we'll circulate that around after this session. Um, also, one of the resources we've included there is an elections toolkit that we uh, produced on IJNet in collaboration with uh, two great organizations, Chequeado and Fact Chequeado. Um, and Fact Chequeado in particular is working in the U.S. combating mis and disinformation, uh, especially in Latino communities across the country. And one of the, you know, in addition to a, a large disinformation focus in that toolkit, one of the the issues we touch on and, and offer advice for journalists on is how to how they can avoid can avoid the pitfalls of so-called horse race coverage. Um, and I, I want to turn back to uh, I guess either Elena or Craig, whichever whoever wants to take this one. Um, how can journalists avoid just simply reporting on the latest polls and really get into and and reach voters? With reporting on you know the consequential consequential issues that will affect them and that they will be deciding their votes on. Do you mean beyond the conventions? During the conventions yeah, so, and beyond. I mean the, that's the thing about the conventions is I mean the most interesting stories are kind of beneath the surface of the horse race. I mean, for one thing, we've had a horse race that has been pretty stable for a long, long time. And we have the same two candidates we had four years ago when it was a jump ball election. Um, and one of the same candidates we had eight years ago. So there's, the, the horse race is actually not that interesting in a lot of ways, at least on a day-to-day -day basis. Now that, you know, the questions around um, Joe Biden's candidacy have made it a little more interesting. But again, it's not, they're not, you don't even have the kind of dramatic swings that we used to have when there were more ticket splitters and when the electorate was less polarized. So yeah, I mean, I think that's an invitation to go well beyond the horse race. Even in the polling, I mean, the most interesting stories are beneath the kind of top line numbers. I mean, they're they're really, you know, to go into the polling and to look at, you know, polling in its aggregate. We do a poll in Wisconsin, the Marquette poll that I'm affiliated with that Charles Franklin conducts. He's been polling in the state for um, for 12 years. And he, he it's the number three poll in the country according to the 538 ratings, but it's also the most transparent poll in the country. So if you're interested, for example, in writing about Wisconsin, the host state of the Republican convention, and you wanna go, you know, you wanna delve into the data about the Wisconsin electorate, about what voters think about issues, about differences between this segment of the electorate and that segment of the electorate by age, by gender, by urban, by rural, by area, um, every way you can slice it, that data is totally transparent. I mean, you can go to the website and you can do your own, you can run your own cross tabs. You can aggregate, you know, all the polls from any given year or from any five years. And so that kind of, um, the beauty is that that kind of, you know, uh, depth of data allows you to kind of, you know, really look, tunnel in and look at um, look at different segments of the electorate and look at their attitudes toward issues. So the polling to me is is a resource. Well, it's a much more interesting resource for that kind of um, th that sort of side of public opinion than for, you know, the horse race in a very polarized electorate where the numbers really never change very much. And the changes are not typically even significant from one week to another. Yeah, I would echo absolutely what Craig said, which is that so much of what makes polling interesting at this point is not actually the top line numbers. It's, it's everything beneath the surface and using those pieces of data to then go find the constituencies um, that help explain it. So one thing that was I was working on before the debate, but but is is no longer as clear. And we got to wait for more data. Was was Joe Biden's strength with older people, with people over sixty five? This is a group of this is a demographic that Democrats haven't won in in almost a, a quarter of a century, and yet he had real 
remarkable staying power and durability with that group. And so, yeah, that comes from a poll, but it gives us some really interesting um, insight into, into, into where uh, the, the Biden campaign is banking on some of their, their path to victory here. So I think I would certainly encourage, even though um, Politico and its founding was, uh, was, was, was catered as the ESPN of politics, we, we do plenty of, of, of reporting and coverage that goes well, well beyond that. And in fact, that's, that is our mandate is to go well beyond that. And I would say second, in terms of ideas about stories that go beyond the horse race, specifically around the convention, I'd look to the platforms and to um, and to how these parties are putting together what they stand for, which is, you know, in some ways, uh, no one's going to go, no voter is probably going to go read like the RNC and DNC's, you know, platform, you know, uh, uh, commitments um, necessarily and inform their decisions that way. But I think that you can pull from that some really interesting changes out of both parties. There's been plenty of discussion about the abortion language for the RNC. That's going to be super fascinating. The same was true back in 2016 around the Hyde, you know, or, or, excuse me, back in 2020 around the Hyde Amendment. So I think going to some of that, to the, the, the platform committees and what they're doing around where each party is declaring their sort of policy stances could yield some really interesting stories about how those positions have changed, who's arguing over what. That's where you're going to find a lot of really interest, interesting tension around particular particular policy issues. Great. Now, I do want to pull in one question we've received, um, and I'll uh, leave it open to whoever would like to chime in on it. Um, so what responsibility, uh, if any, um, do journalists have when it comes to reporting on mis and disinformation? Um, I guess we can make it, you know, surrounding the convention, around the elections in general. Oh, uh, just one small point I'd make is that, I mean, one of the dilemmas that journalists constantly face when it comes to misinformation is uh, striking a balance between reporting the disinformation and refuting it uh, without giving it a bigger, broader platform. So sometimes your options are choosing between ignoring it, which feels, you know, not ideal uh, because then it's unchallenged uh, and, you know, uh, giving it legs, but trying to knock it down, which is not ideal either. And so that's a dilemma that I feel like is you have to just sort of deal with on a case by case basis. And I think sometimes we we kind of err in in either direction. I think, you know, if you if we all of us spent all of our time and we could spend all of our time um, knocking down uh, false claims, you wouldn't have time to do anything else. And then there would be um, a lot a lot of your reporting mission would just go undone. And so that's a tricky, um, a tricky tension. I think we all face. Great, Hope. I a, a quick follow up on that for you. Um, do you have any perspective or advice on potentially addressing misinformation as it might be affecting young people, maybe on certain platforms that are more popular with with younger voters? Um, anything that you've come across in your work, uh, reaching younger younger audiences? Um, yeah, I, well, first I'll say that I think Craig is absolutely right that it's very slippery slope when it comes to addressing misinformation or not. Um, I would say like to any like youth person though, um, honestly to any person, I think it's important to just do the research yourself. I think a lot of youth individuals like rely on social media and what's being spread to um you know tiktok for example to get their news and it's not to say that everything that you're getting from those platforms isn't true but i do think it's easiest to just go straight to the source go straight to the document um so i would say that i do think it is a major issue among youth voters um and media literacy i mean is an issue amongst people across uh the country and world so it's not an easy fix but i would always advise that just go straight to the source i think you'll uh be able to make a better judgment for yourself and you'll feel more empowered to to have discussions about it because you'll have seen the documents um you'll have listened to the video you'll have been there even if that's the case so 
Great. And one more follow up for Catherine on this topic. Do you see ripple effects from, you know, large amounts of mis and disinformation uh, as it might affect journalists' safety? Um, and are there things that journalists can keep in mind uh, as they might combat disinformation with regard to their safety? Yeah, I mean, I think that having mis and disinformation circulating um, in the you know me larger media ecosystem is really problematic because it kind of undercuts. Well, it, it leads to a, a poor understanding of what journalists actually do, and if people again don't have, as Hope was saying, if there's not you know media literacy and understanding that you know this reporting is in fact, disinformation and this reporting is can be trusted and is from a verifiable source and, and they've really, you know, been through the editing process and 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 done the work properly. Um, it's it's really harmful. And I think it leads to then a confusion um and uh growing distrust in in the media, which in turn you know, leads to a growing dissatisfaction with the media, which leads to a greater distrust in journalism and you know and the institution writ large, which, you know, again, like we're talking big picture trickle down effect, but also kind of undercuts reporters security, because if, if people don't believe you and think that you're, you know, not doing your job correctly, there's less respect, um, and there's less, um, a less safe environment in which to, to operate. Gotcha. And I, I'm not sure if I answered the second part of your question or not. Sorry. No, that was great. Thanks, Catherine. Um, so we are getting toward the end of our, our time here. I do want to ask one question uh, as well. You know, We've talked a lot about reporters covering the convention in person uh, from within the U.S. You know, a lot of our audience on IJNet is international, is based abroad. And I'm sure a lot of the advice that we've talked about today is is very uh, applicable to, to what they'll, they'll be experiencing. But is there anything in particular, anything more that, you know, people from abroad, journalists from abroad should keep in mind as they're reporting on these conventions coming up? Uh, I think a lot of people will know this, but the State Department has a foreign press center that offers resources to international reporters covering American politics. So, and I think they offer information very tailored to the conventions as well. Um, I think it's a great you know, conventions can be a great resource for international reporters because they often face challenges in sourcing uh, when they're covering American politics um, because newsmakers in America aren't as invested in what is being reported abroad as they are in what is being reported domestically. So that's a challenge. And I think, again, the convention offers some alternatives because of what Elena was saying earlier about just the kind of possibilities for buttonholing uh, people, for random encounters, for just, you know, kind of using the level of activity around a convention and leveraging that. And um, some of that's going to be serendipity, but it is, it's just a huge kind of giant reporting opportunity that doesn't sort of exist in Washington on a regular basis. Great. All right, and I think we'll start wrapping up here. Maybe I'd, I'd just like to get maybe top one top line advice from each of you for, for the journalists tuning in. And maybe I'll start with Elena for you with your uh, crazy beat these days and what you're covering. Um, I, I just would go back and I'm sorry, I feel like I'm totally beating a dead horse here, but I, I agree that this is just such a rich sourcing opportunity. This is a chance that if you happen to be on the ground in either Chicago or Milwaukee, do everything you can to meet as many people. You know, I I remember as particularly as a student journalist being sort of awkward about asking people for their cell phone numbers. Ask for their cell phone number. They've all been asked this a million times. Just go for it. Ask for cell phone numbers. Um, you know, try try and keep a sort of running list in your head of the people that you do want to try and find. Where are they going to be? What events are they going to be speaking at? Or where will they be around? Um, like Cred said, these opportunities don't necessarily come around all that often. And um, and I think that there's just going to be enormous amount of activity and volume of people in one place. And so use that to your advantage in trying to build up and strengthen your source network. Great. And Catherine, I'll let you go next. 
Yeah, I, I do feel like I'm kind of uh, repeating the same message, but but prepare for the worst and hope for the best is kind of, I think, what's, what's really important uh, to think about going into this election cycle and to the conventions. Um, you know, the, the horrible scenarios, you know, hopefully won't happen, but it's really good to have a, have contingency plans, have exit plans and prepare ahead of time for, for what might come. So, thanks. Great, and hope. Yeah. Um just to echo, I think this is an amazing opportunity. I know I'm super excited for it. I think there's a lot of pressure with it to produce as many stories as possible because it seems like there's so many stories happening all the time because there are. Um, but I think it's also okay to like put your heart into a few that are going to be impactful and meaningful and kind of to an earlier point about how to engage youth voters and marginalized communities. I think that's going to be important. I think it's going to be um, important to be intentional about who you speak to, the stories that you tell. Um, so yeah, I think that would be my advice is put your heart into a few and see what happens. Finally, Craig. Yeah, I would just say, you know, know your mission and have a plan. I mean, you can't go into a convention like this just, you know, reacting to events, but not having a strategy. And, um, you know, based on your audience, your own interests, your role, everything else, um, you should have a story list that you want to execute. And you have to you have to go, you know, adapt to events. But if you go if you don't go in with that mission, with that strategy and without that with that plan, a convention can be totally paralyzing because there's just so much activity going on around you. Great. Um, thank you all. Uh, again, all of our panelists for joining us today. Uh, we're going to wrap up here. Thanks to everyone tuning in today. Um, for those who could not, we'll have a recording up on YouTube. We will publish a recap with key tips and takeaways and advice from each of our four panelists. Um, Another thanks to our great partners, the Foley Foundation, Marquette University, Northwestern University, and the Committee to Protect Journalists for helping organize and run this event. Um, again, and one final thank you to Craig, Elena, Hope, and Catherine uh, for taking part today, sharing your insights. I think it's really invaluable for, for our audience. And everyone stay safe. Thanks for watching and good luck covering the conventions.